So do what thou wilt to be the whole of the law. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Kellen, as you can probably see from the name next to my face. Um, welcome to Ordo Templi Orientis, or what is Ordo Templi Orientis? Um, this is the first class in our, uh, that is in Horizon Lodge's OTO 101 series. Uh, the purpose of this class is to answer the questions that someone new to Thelema or to OTO might have, and to do so really as clearly and concisely as possible. Um, Thelema can be pretty jargon heavy, and we know that that jargon can be a barrier for new people to really understand what's going on. So what I'm going to attempt to do is... Um, uh, is I'm going to attempt to strip out as much of that jargon as possible. So the goal of this isn't really, um, you know, explain it like I'm five, but more like explain it like I'm an adult, but you guys use kind of weird words in kind of weird ways. So I don't know what they mean. Um, and so hopefully that we, we can accomplish that. Uh, this class and this class series is very much geared towards people who are interested in OTO, but have either never been or are still pretty new. So if you've been around since like Germer was in charge, I might not have a lot to offer you, unfortunately. Um, that being said, uh, it could always be helpful to hear these things explained in different ways, even if you've been around for a while, because you might need to explain it yourself. Um, before we really begin, uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, hopefully not too much. Uh, I'm currently the master of Horizon Lodge in Seattle. I'm a priest in EGC, and I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a chartered initiator in OTO. I'm a member of OTO since 2010, and I was practicing the Lama for about eight years before that. So I'm cautiously optimistic that I can give you that I can give you some information that, uh, while well, some Thelemites are gonna quibble about the details because they always will, um, hopefully it'll be the sort of thing that 95% of Thelemites would agree with about 95%. If I can hit that mark, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, and just to kind of establish what the goals are, once this class is over, you should have an understanding of what the OTO is, what is its mission and what it does um, in terms of like the actual activities. You should also have a basic understanding of how to find an OTO body near you. Um, I'm going to actually demonstrate that, how to get involved, what to expect at an OTO event, and um, what kind of behavior we expect of people who are just showing up. Um, that's really useful. If any of that isn't clear, or if you have additional questions, I'd be happy to answer them at the end. Please put them in the chat so that uh, you don't forget and um, I'll address them at the end of the presentation. It's just much, much easier in the Zoom format to take care of all that stuff at the end. Uh, thank you. Let's get started. So the first, the three questions we, oh, that's what I said, what we'll cover. Um, of what we'll cover is what is the uh, OTO? Um, the first three questions, what is OTO, what is its mission, and what does it do, are all addressed in the mission statement of USGL, United States Grand Lodge. Um, just so you know, because this is for new people, OTO is kind of divided into national sections. Um, there's a US Grand Lodge, there's a UK Grand Lodge, there's also international for every country so don't have enough of a presence to have a Grand Lodge. USGL is the United States Grand Lodge. Um, and the mission statement reads, Ordo Templi Orientis USA is the U.S. Grand Lodge National Section of Ordo Templi Orientis, a hierarchical religious membership organization. Our mission is to effect and promote the doctrines and practices of the philosophical and religious system known as the Lema, with particular emphasis on cultivating the ideals of individual liberty, self-discipline, self-knowledge, and universal brotherhood. To this end, we conduct sacramental and initiatory rites, offer guidance and instruction to our members, organize social events, and engage in educational and community service activities at locations throughout the United States. 
So that's kind of a lot, um, but it does address all three of those things. What is OTO? What is its mission? What does it do? So let's kind of pick it apart um, one sentence at a time. So the first sentence there does, I think, a pretty good job of describing what OTO is. Ordo Templi Orientis USA is dot, 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 a hierarchical religious membership organization. We'll spend a little bit of time on that, starting at the end. Um, not usually the best place to start, but here it is. OTO is a membership organization. That's pretty simple, right? So we're an organization that has members and you join and then you're a member or you're not a member. Um, it's like the Elks or a food co-op or the AARP. It's something that you join. Um, the religious part is pretty straightforward too. We're a membership organization that has religious and spiritual aims and teachings. That's easy peasy. It's the hierarchical bit that probably requires some unpacking because sometimes people get the wrong idea about this. What hierarchical means in this context is that the teachings of OTO are communicated gradually through a series of initiation ceremonies called degrees. That's really it. That we communicate things a little bit at a time. I'll talk about this more in the last class in the series, what is initiation? But at a really basic level, this is so you have time to learn and digest the material. It would be silly to teach it all at once. Nothing, nothing works like that. You know, imagine like sitting down and trying to teach someone all the math you know in one sitting. It just wouldn't work. It would be completely unhelpful. So the degrees have names. And they go in a certain order. First, you're a Minerva. Second, you're a first, and then you're a second, because that's logical, and so on. And that helps us when we're hanging out together, not blab about something in front of someone who hasn't experienced it yet and ruin the surprise for them, because that would be rude. So, you know, you could sit around with a bunch of OTO people and like, hey, what's the common degree? And that's just so that we know what to talk about so someone doesn't get their experience ruined. If someone's a second degree, it doesn't mean that they're more enlightened than a first degree or anything like that. It just means that they've been exposed to more of the OTO material. It doesn't mean that they've practiced it or understood it. It doesn't even mean that they were paying attention. Um, it just means that they've been exposed to that material and had an opportunity to learn it in the initiation degree. Uh, the degrees are also related to the organizational structure but the fundamental thing is that we teach things, our teachings in this kind of progressive fashion. Um, yeah. Some people think that the degrees being related to the organizational structure is important. I mean, it kind of is, but every organization has like an organizational structure. That's what makes it an organization. Okay. So now you should know what sort of thing OTO is. Uh, we're an organization that has members that you join, you can join, that has spiritual and religious teachings that are communicated in a gradual fashion, bit by bit. Let's look at that second sentence. It describes our mission. It even says so right there. Our mission is to effect and promote the doctrines and practices of the philosophical and religious system known as the Lema with particular emphasis on cultivating the idea, ideals of individual liberty, self-discipline, self-knowledge, and universal brotherhood. Cool. So the purpose of OTO, a membership organization, is to practice and promote the lema, emphasizing these particular ideas or virtues or what have you. I'm only going to give a super brief summary of the lema right now because until Ikea is going to teach the next class all about that. Uh, but in a nutshell, the Lema is a spiritual system about attaining freedom by discovering the truth of and about yourself. We call it true will in the Lema. And then living and pursuing that truth to the exclusion of everything else. There's more to it than that because of course there is. We've got gods and holy books and everything. It's really cool. But I think that that's a pretty good one sentence description. If, you know, I met someone on the street and they want to know. So why are these four 
ideals important. Individual liberty, self-discipline, self-knowledge, and universal brotherhood. Individual liberty is important because, um, because once you know the truth about yourself, once you know your deep purpose, you have to be able to do it. Also, you should let other people do theirs. Self-discipline is important because whatever your truth is, it's probably more work than scrolling Facebook and eating ice cream. Sometimes being true to yourself is hard and it takes discipline to just buckle down and do it. Self-knowledge is important on a couple levels. Um, so knowing your truth, your true will is a big part of this, that's self-knowledge. But self-knowledge is also you know, knowing that putting a chicken in the oven and then walking away to play Minecraft doesn't work for you because you'll end up eating gross dry chicken for a week. That's also self-discipline, ask me how I know. Those three, uh, self-discipline, self-knowledge and individual liberty are about being better at knowing and doing your truth, the, or the truth about you, your true will. What about universal brotherhood? Uh, there's two things I have to say about this. Um, the first is that in our principal holy book, the book of the law, there's this line, every man and every woman is a star. If you want to parse this into some like non thalamic language, it might be something like every human being has a divine soul or something like that. That's not really precise because like it's already precise. Um, and I think that the way that it's expressed in the book, the law is really kind of poetically clear. You know, every man and every woman is a star. We all have this thing in common and it's really profoundly divine. And this is centrally important to the labor. It's the third verse of our most important holy book. It's right there at the beginning. You can't miss it. And because we have this in common, we are all siblings because we are all stars. And consequently, we all share the same divine parentage that is the universe. So that's the lofty spiritual part. And, and it's awesome. There's a more down to earth part of universal brotherhood. And it's this, uh, if you pay attention OTO will teach you how to be a thelemite and to have a thelemite while keeping your friends. That can be kind of tough. I'll talk more about this a little bit later, but OTO does teach an ethic. Uh, I'm going to share a brief quote from chapter 72 of Crowley's Confessions, where he is describing his intent in writing the OTO rituals. Quote, I therefore answered the question, how should a young man mend his way in a series of rituals in which the candidate is instructed in the value of discretion, loyalty, independence, truthfulness, courage, self-control, indifference to circumstance, impartiality, skepticism, and other virtues. End quote. The lema is about freedom. It is not about being a bull in the china shop of your life and relationships. Finally, that last sentence of the mission statement describes what OTO does, how we accomplish our mission. To this end, we conduct sacramental and initiatory rites, offer guidance and instruction to our members, organize social events, and engage in educational and community service activities at locations throughout the United States. I think all of this is really pretty clear, except maybe the part about sacramental and initiatory rites. Until Lakea is going to talk about what is the Thalamic church in the fourth class, and I'm going to talk about what is initiation in the fifth, but very briefly, here sacramental rites refers to the Gnostic mass. And initiatory rites refers to our initiation ceremonies that I mentioned earlier. The Gnostic Mass is a Thalamic religious ceremony that contains a ton of OTO philosophy about life in the universe. Um, there's many public performances of this around the country. It's very beautiful, and I highly recommend that you attend if you think that you might be interested in OTO and what we do. The initiations are the ceremonies I mentioned that gradually communicate the inner teachings of OTO. 
The reason I'm not going more deeply into these now is because they're both important enough, they're, excuse me, they're both important enough to warrant the two classes we're gonna teach just about that in uh, several weeks. Okay, so let's look back at where we've been. OTO is an organization that has spiritual and religious teachings commun communicated gradually to its members through a series of ceremonies called initiations. Its spiritual teachings are centered around thelema, which is a philosophy about finding the truth of yourself and about yourself and finding freedom by pursuing that truth with disciplined focus. It does all this by performing the Gnostic Mass, the initiation ceremonies, classes, and various social events and functions like that. Uh, and I know that I kind of breezed through all this. If, I'm happy to talk about it more at the end if people would like that. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, that you know, now that you know what OTO is, that you think that's awesome and you want to know if you can attend an OTO event near you, what can you do? Let's start with that. And how do you do it? Okay. So for the most part, as someone who is not yet an initiate of OTO, we call a member an initiate because they've been initiated, you can attend any OTO event that isn't an initiation, unless maybe it's your own. There are exceptions to this. Sometimes there are classes that are about a particular degree or something really specific like that. But for the most part, it's true. If it's not like explicitly private, it's public. So if there's an OTO body in your area, you could probably attend the Gnostic Mass or the classes or discussion groups, seasonal rituals, things like that. How do you know if there's an OTO body near you? You could go to, I'll show you. I'm actually gonna walk you through this whole process and it's gonna be awesome. You go to oto-usa.org slash uh, locations. Pull this up. Okay, this is the OTO US Grand Lodge website. So if you go up here, click on locations, it's gonna be this sweet, swanky map. And it's gonna show uh, all the OTO locations in the United States. Right now there are none in Alaska or Hawaii, so that's accurate, unfortunately. You can go over here to click the one nearest you, and it's gonna pop up with this awesome box. If you click on the name, it will take you to the website. That's our beautiful website. And there's usually a pretty easy to find calendar link that will tell you all the stuff that's going on. And you can uh, just kind of go through that and see what looks neat. Um, so let's suppose that you found an OTO body near you. You found their calendar and there's an event that looks super fascinating that you want to go to. What next? If it's open to the public, you could generally just show up and that's fine. But I really recommend contacting them first, especially right now in the middle of COVID. I guarantee that the body master will really appreciate it. Um, but uh, always, really, people like it when you let them know that you're coming. Um, you could do this via email or Facebook or whatever. That's going to depend a little bit on the individual body. But sending a message saying, hey, I'm new and I'd like to come to this thing that you're doing is 100% better than just showing up and saying, um, hi, is this the OTO? Uh, at the very least, like they'll be prepared with someone to like be there to answer your questions. Um, and something I want to acknowledge because I'm here in Seattle at Horizon Lodge is that, and so this is a little bit of a horizon centric talk, if I'm being really honest, is that local differences in bodies do exist. Um, for example, uh, if you show up at Horizon and it looks like you just want to sit in the corner and like observe and not socialize for a while, we're probably 
just going to respect that as long as you're doing it politely and respectfully. And it's not because we don't want to talk to you. Probably. It's probably not because we don't want to talk to you. It's um, a respect thing, right? Like, if you don't want to socialize, I, I know personally how intimidating it could be to go into a new place where everyone seems to know each other and, you know, they, they all know how things work. Um, and it could be really helpful to just observe. Um, so I get that. We're, we're not going to try to force conversation upon you if you aren't into it. Um, another thing, you know, another example is like at Horizon, we might have wine after mass, but we don't open it before. Other places don't have any alcohol aside from, you know, sacramental alcohol or what have you. Some places don't care. Um, another related note, and this is because we sometimes get asked, there is no formal mentoring system in OTO. Uh, you're not AA. You do not have a superior or a teacher in OTO. Let's see if I can correct this. Um, now, that being said, if you have questions about things, feel free to ask. We're happy to help. We try to be helpful. Um, it's just that you don't have like someone assigned to you to, to help you out. But we do try to be welcoming and kind. So finally, I want to address one last set of things that are the kind of go together. Um, suppose you're going to an OT event. OTO event, and suppose specifically it's a Horizon event because that's what I can really talk about most, but I think that this generally applies. And that's kind of like, what is the code of conduct? Um, you know, how are you expected to behave once you're in the lodge? And relatedly, how do I expect myself and the officers and members of Horizon to behave? Um, so this is OTO Behavioral Expectations 015. This is the remedial level. It should go without saying, but a very solid baseline is don't commit any crimes. Theft and violence and sexual assault are all bad. If that is not obvious to you, please do not come to my lodge. Um, so yeah, just do nothing at an OTO event that will make me want to call the police. Since you're all listening here at this awesome talk, and I haven't uh, had to, the people that have not been booted, um, I assume that you have enough good sense to know that, but it's just worth getting out because people will see this video on YouTube. Also, even though OTO has no moral stance against drugs, any drugs that are federally illegal are prohibited at OTO events. I know that cannabis is legal in some states, including my own, but since it's federally illegal, it's still prohibited at OTO events, even in those states. That's the how to behave 015 level. Uh, how should you conduct yourself if you want to be accepted in our community and maybe even find sponsors for initiation? This is the 101 level. Um, a pretty good way to think about this is to look at the OTO USGL value statement. I'm just go, go ahead and read this to you. It, I think it's really great. We support the liberty of the individual and the cultivation of self-respect, self-knowledge, self-discipline, and self-responsibility. Two, we affirm the bonds of fraternity and expect fidelity, frankness, cooperation, mutual aid, and good faith among our members. Three, we value hospitality in our community and promote peace, tolerance, truth, and respect to the order within our temples and precincts. Four, we advocate the principles of scientific religion and universal brotherhood and oppose tyranny, superstition, and oppression. Five, we accept and uphold the law of the Lema as promulgated in the Book of the Law and the writings of the prophet of the Aeon, Alistair Crowley. Six, we believe that a membership free from unfair discrimination is essential to accomplishing our mission and reject doctrines that promote bigotry, prejudice, and intolerance. So I don't think that you have to look at this 
too hard to get an idea of what kind of behavior we like to see in our initiates and guests. Be a good guest, um, you know, that's a good guideline. Uh, have some self-control. For instance, you know, don't get drunk at events. Um, take responsibility for your actions. If you do something wrong or did upset someone, try to fix it, try to work it out. Maybe say you're sorry. Um, tell the truth, don't bullshit or be a troll to try to get a rise out of people. Ask questions and talk to people instead of making assumptions. This is all, you know, real simple. Don't be a jerk. Don't sexually harass people. Don't say or do things that are racist or sexist or homophobic or transphobic. All of that, by the way, falls under don't be a jerk. None of this is rocket science, and I'm sure that you've got this all handled. But seriously, if you've never been to an OTO event before, look at our value statement and you know, get familiar with it and think about it. If you read that and think, those aren't my values, then this probably isn't the organization for you. Look at that three beats. How about officers and members of the lodge? Well, we sure don't get a pass. I expect myself and officers and members to ha have a higher conduct of behavior, even than that. Um, we should do all of those things that I just asked of you and more. In particular, we should be good hosts. We should try to make you feel welcome. We should try to answer your questions. And if you have concerns about, you know, what, what does this mean or anything like that, we should take that seriously. Um, we should look out for your comfort and your safety while you're at the lodge. And if, I meant to go to this. Be a good guest and we'll be try to be good hosts. And I'm just going to look at this quote from uh, the Confessions one more time because I think it's really good and kind of drives home that uh, you know there there is an ethic and kind of expectation of good behavior built into the system from the outset. I therefore answer the question, how should a young man bend his way in a series of rituals in which the candidate is instructed in the value of discretion, loyalty, independence, truthfulness, courage, self-control, indifference to circumstance, impartiality, skepticism, and other virtues. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I really hope you found this useful. If um, you would like to find out more, please check out seattle-oto.org and oto-usa.org. I'll put those links in the chat. Um, and if this has answered any questions that you had about OTO, uh, please consider donating to Horizon Lodge by PayPaling us at horizon at seattle-oto.org. I'll put that in there as well. Um, that, um, helps us to keep doing things like this. So thank you very much. Love is the law, love under will. Okay, I'm gonna start from, uh, there was a question, what about sex work? Um, until a chaos has entered the waiting room. Okay, what about sex work? Um, so OTO has, or I should say Thalema has no, moral problem with sex work whatsoever. Um, one of Crowley's documents that is called um, Lieber Oz, you know, says man has the right to work as he will. And uh, elsewhere, you know, man has the, the right to love as he will, when, where, and whom he will. So, um, you know, there's no, there's no problem with that. If I'm not answering your question, feel free to, to, uh, um, to chime in and let me know, but there's, you know, not really a position on it because it's like kind of outside the sphere of what our ethics are about, right? Like as long as everyone's consenting adults, then we don't have a problem with that. Okay. What is scientific religion? Uh, scientific religion is, that's a really good question. Scientific religion is an attempt to apply some kind of rational basis to our spiritual experience, right? And so if I know that 
if I meditate, be, I get you know 30 minutes every day, first thing in the morning, that I get these certain results, that I try not to have too many metaphysical assumptions about that. And that that's just the, um, that's the result. That, that's a good question. I, I'll have to try to think about that maybe post something on, on Facebook. But uh, yeah, I think it's an attempt to start with the facts and work back to the metaphysics instead of the other way around. That was great. Is this the PayPal above? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I think that I got all of them that were in the chat, but I'd be happy to talk uh, more. People want me to. Hi, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, so my, my, I live in New York city. I'm mm -hmm. zooming from across the country and the, the local OTO lodge has been like not totally closed, but basically closed with COVID and that kind of thing. And, um, I guess I was wondering, I mean, kind of specific to that, but more broadly, is there to be initiated into the OTO, like degree zero, et cetera, uh -huh. is it, is there a threshold amount of, um, work that you have to do, whether that's like the Liebers or attendance at meetings or ritual, et cetera? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so no, what, what is required to be initiated into OTO, and I think that this will help uh, answer Ryan's question as well, is that you have to be free and full age, so at least 18, um, and able to make it to the ceremony. Um, of good report, and I'll explain that, Ryan, and you have to get two sponsors. So you have to get who are of the first degree or higher. So you have to get to know two people who are members of the OTO well enough that they're willing to vouch for your character. Um, and uh, hopefully they take that seriously, they really should. Um, and you know, hopefully you want them to take that seriously. Um, but uh, that that doesn't necessarily have to be at an OTO event. That could be, you know, that you meet in person over coffee. And um, uh, okay, I got you, Meryl. Um, I was make a, like, is this where I make the Groucho Marx joke about like, I wouldn't want to, yeah, okay. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well, like, I, I wouldn't mean, want to be part of a club that would have me as a member, whatever. Well, it's so here. I'm not I don't know if I'd myself. say that, but I mean, yeah. And so what, what I tell people when they're talking to me about sponsorship is that if someone does it too lightly, find a different sponsor, right? Because um, you, at some point, you, 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 if you're joining the order, you're going to be like oathbound to those people. You want to be on that boat with people who would like take it seriously. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do this if you didn't take it seriously. Um, but does that answer your question? So yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure if it was like. I mean, every every place has this kind of different, you know, must be this tied to ride the ride kind of thing, right? So I was just wondering what the kind of baseline was for OTO membership. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, there's there's no knowledge or work assumed at the Minerval degree. That no prior knowledge. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, cool. Thank you. Oh, okay, and um, Meryl, you have a, uh, I'm going to take these just in order, or actually, Meryl, go ahead, because I think that's a clarifying point on what I just Yeah, said. it's really, it's really more of a clarifying point. Great job, Kellen, by the way, really appreciate that. I just want to clarify to Sarah, uh, so my name is Meryl Ward, everybody, I've been a longtime OTO member, I'll just out myself here. Um, and so, uh, Kellen made the clear point, free, full age, good report. So free means that you are not incarcerated or unable to take a binding oath to the order. That's right. really what free means. Uh, full age is, um, I think it's 18 to take Minerva, but 21 to take first degree? Second. Second degree. Okay, got it. That's good clarifying point. And, um, and Kellen mentioned the good report piece, which is kind of a Masonic holdover convention where somebody would put somebody forward in the lodge. So he's exactly right. Two sponsors. And 
Uh, and you want to make sure that sponsors aren't putting any weird conditions on you, yes. which some people can do. But a sponsor does have the right to have certain conditions in place. For example, if I were going to sponsor somebody, my condition is that if there's something going on that they're having an issue with, that they promise to at least come to me and have a conversation with me about it so I can assist them in that process. And that's a good sponsorship policy. It's not requisite within OTO. It's something that, that I have the condition. But in that way, it allows things not to get out of control if somebody's having a particular issue, especially if it's a personal issue with somebody else. So just to clarify. And it also doesn't mean that within the context of those degrees, we are not given materials with which we can then study and do a deeper dive into that degree itself, including um, including um, degree uh, study guides that help us to go deeper into the symbolism of those degrees and in certain places, symbolism classes about the deeper symbolism of the allegory of those degrees. And that's where it can get really, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Meryl. That's a really good point yeah. about um, that free is a very specific thing. And um, yeah, good report means you can get two people to sponsor you and that you're not bad report on bad report, which means that you've behaved badly and now everyone at the order knows about it. Um, uh, can you explain what good, I think, did I answer your question, Ryan? I think that I did. It was not um, the good report one, Kellen. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It means um, also not being of bad report, meaning right. that you do not do things within the lodge that you know bring controversy uh, into in, into your reputation. And there are specific modalities within the context of OTO that you can follow things out when you are having issues, and uh, there are specific ways of doing that and conventions to follow to do that. Do any of the degrees require you to bring in new members for advancement? Um, uh, well, so I've just, uh, I don't think this is secret and maybe someone will inform me I'm wrong later. To take the fourth degree, you have to sponsor two Minervals. Um, I think that that's uh, a, it's out there somewhere, um, but it's not really an onerous requirement. I think of that more as part of the training and getting out there and talking to people rather than part of some crazy pyramid scheme. None of us get paid, I promise. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm late. Can you help me understand the relationship and differences between AA and OTO? Uh, yeah, I can do my best. Um, we didn't talk about that, but that's a good question. One thing I did mention is that in OTO, there is no, um, there's no sort of mentorship system. Like OTO is kind of a choose your own adventure novel, right? Like um, you take the degree and then you get some, a study guide about like read these books, try these practices and you either do or you don't. And then you take, sign the application, you take the next degree. And you either like study it or you don't. Um, and at a certain point that kind of changes and people want to you know, know that you have, uh, learned the material before you're invited to subsequent degrees. But for the most part, it's, you know, it is what you put into it. Um, AA is different. AA, and I'm not a member of AA, so this is a little bit based on my own, uh, you know, what I've read and public knowledge. Um, you know, there, you have an instructor. Once you get to sufficient grade, you have students, and you don't talk to anyone else in AA. There's no social events. There's, um, yeah. well, just a sec, here, I'll finish my sentence. Uh, um, you know, there's no social events. There's not the same sort of public physical presence like OTO has. Um, OTO is about creating a society. Um, AA is about the individual. Uh, Meryl, if you want to. Uh, yeah, that, that was a really, really good point, Kellen. A AA is a strictly guru cello relationship, meaning the only people that you know in AA is the person that introduces you and any person that you're going to introduce. So there is a teacher-student relationship that creates what's called a katena 
or a chain. People talk about lineages of AA, which is inaccurate because there are katanas there. Who are you connected to? And then eventually, as you move forward, you are expected to bring a student underneath you. And you don't advance until your student is ready to advance. And it's a very, very sp particular uh, training structure. Whereas OTO, very much as Kellen said, is, is a society. And you kind of move at your own pace through that. And when you're ready to move on, although there are partic particular uh, time qualifications in each degree, then you move through that degree and then you get ready to take your next degree. Yeah, one thing that I um, think it's worth mentioning about that, the time qualifications, is that there are some minimum times between degrees, usually about a year. Um, oh, I'm saying this at the end, but there's no like maximum time. If you want to be a Minerval for five years, that's fine. Um, there's no rush. Through, through the degrees. Uh, are there any paid employees of the order? I don't think so. Um, none that I know of, and I've met a lot of the big wigs, not all of the big wigs. Volunteer organization. Um, there are certain members of OTO who do certain things for the order who may have dues waived in lieu. Uh, of that, but that's about it. And even people who are still working pretty hard within the order uh, are still paying pretty high due structures. Uh, as you advance more in OTO, uh, dues and fees go up and those are separate things. So you're paying dues to kind of be involved on an annual basis and particular fees that are involved for taking the initiations themselves. And those are two distinct things. Yeah. One thing I want to clarify though about that, Meryl, um, is that uh, the dues do increase, but um, we're not Scientology. They're, they they never get that high. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm uh, I'm about halfway through this whole thing, and I pay I think two hundred dollars a year to USGL. So uh, does the OTO encourage specific political positions? Um, no, uh, I think that. Thalema is incompatible with certain things, but that's my own personal belief. And other people will probably think the opposite thing that I do. Um, yeah. We are prohibited as a 401c3, 501c3 organ, religious yeah. organization as from endorsing political candidates or specific positions. Uh, it's a pretty cool background, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, the, the floors take a lot of time to clean. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> All right, I'd be happy to answer more questions if people have them. Callan, just, you know, in here's a good one, you know. If I wanted to take my Minerval degree, uh, I know I have, get, I have to get, you know, two sponsors. Um, if I approached uh, Horizon, for example, could mm -hmm. Horizon help me connect with other members of the Lodge to help me find those sponsors? Yeah. So um, specifically, if I, I can help more if you're in the Seattle area, um, because I know basically everyone here. If, uh, you know, uh, Sarah, I, I know some people in New York, but you're going to have better luck uh, talking to the, the New York body. Um, that being said, if someone emails uh, Seattle, I, I, I do my best to help either to connect them to individuals or to the local body. Yeah, OTO also has a public information officer, and even though that's more for press and media relations, that public relation officer, if you reach out directly, can usually put you in touch with a local body in your area. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I I do have a Thelemite friend here who I believe is a member of the, the Tahuti Lodge here, but I'm not, I'd actually have to ask him. I know he was like back... I, I did like an Alistair Crowley reading group with him earlier in the year and it kind of like set me on a certain path, but I, but I did a, um, plus I, I mean, I, the, I don't want to get into my, I don't want to label, I don't want to saddle people with my own background, but this is also part of my broader work that I do. But, um, 
uh, I, he, he, he's kept being like, we have to go to a Gnostic mass together. And I'm like, I know, but it's pandemic <laughs> not doing one. And, um, and I really want to go to one in person, but you know, uh, all, all extenuating circumstances, but thank you. That, that, that's really great. Um, I guess other, other than, I know the Gnostic mass is like the big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, what are some other kind of like, I, I guess, like, is it are the other main holidays or occasions like the the writing of the book of the law? Is that just like or is are there other ceremonies in addition to that that are like important that we should know about? So that's a good question. Um, a lot of it is kind of local flavor. Um, so at Horizon, we tend to do and um, Kurt, I do see your question. Excuse me. Uh, at Horizon, we tend to do seasonal rituals a lot. Um, you know, so the the uh, qu- cross the quarter rituals. Well, we don't do cross quarter rituals. That'd be fun, but that would be a lot. That'd be twice as much work. So you know, solstices and equinoxes. Uh, we tend to do something for the writing of the book of the law. Um, when we celebrate the first night of the prophet and his bride, it tends to be a barbecue, um, which is great, but not really a ritual. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's um, often there's usually some regular seasonal things like that. Of course, COVID has interrupted that. Um, And uh, there's plenty of classes. Sometimes someone just kind of gets a crazy hair and does a ritual just because they want to. Um, That's not, uh, uh, right, the rites of Eleusis. Yeah, those are fun. Um, Yeah, those are actually really fun. So most lodges I... Well, I should not say lodges. I should say local bodies because uh, there's lodges, oases, and camps. I could talk about that a little bit if you want. Um, But um, most local bodies do seasonal rituals. Um, It's just that there's nothing prescribed. So what they do is going to be, you know, local culture. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, What does the oath consist of? What are you pledging? Um, so the specific the specifics of the oath are something I can't tell you. Um, that actually is secret. Um, that's part of the substance in the teaching of the degrees. Um, you know, I think if you uh, look back at if you were here um, when I went through the, uh, the, the, the the my slide deck, you know, the the basic the lamic. <laughs> or at OTO ethic is no crimes. Then like after that, so like try to be a good person. Um, so I, I feel pretty comfortable telling you that you're, there's nothing really crazy in there. You're not going to like have to break the law to follow your oath. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't tell you the, um, the specifics of that, unfortunately, but you know, I've sponsored by friends if that tells you anything like um there's cross quarter rituals sometimes uh depends on the specific local body um merrill raised his hand yeah i just wanted to if i if you don't mind me commenting i i feel like i'm butting in a lot kellen and i don't want i hope i don't want to kind of overtake but um, you know, in regards to the oaths of the order, they can't be specifically given out, but they are along the lines of Masonic oaths. They have a, a flavor of them, and uh, each one pertains to the partic- particular degree. You know, the Minerval is kind of a, a welcome guest degree. It's a welcoming into the order. Uh, it's pretty common knowledge that the first degree represents birth. The second degree represents life. And the third degree represents death. And the fourth degree uh, represents kind of that which exists beyond these things. And so the O's specifically have to deal with these aspects. And they're mostly allegorical in their function, but they do have very, very um, specific aspects of them that allow you to connect in more with yourself and allow you to connect in more with the order. And they have specific, I'll call them charges, that um, kind of call you into more um, congruency with who you are. And the thing with an oath is, if you ever don't like what you're taking, you stop. 
And you just want to listen very, very closely when you are taking those oaths. Um, myself, having been through many of these degrees, have never found any of them inconsistent with who I am as an individual and who I choose to be in aligning myself with my true will and purpose in life. And that's what it is really meant to do. It's to bring you into congruency with who you are and who you're actively choosing to be and how you actively choose to conform yourself, comport yourself to be in alignment with your true will purpose. Are there ramifications to choosing not to make a certain oath? So I'm gonna um, just kind of answer your question, Buddy, by uh, reiterating something Meryl said. That is that at any point in any OTO initiation, you could say, stop. Like, I'm not cool with this. Um, let's talk about it or just be done. Um, you know, so in a sense, an initiation is not something where you're entirely passive, right? Um, it might feel that way, but you can always say, no, we, we believe in like individual autonomy. Stop. I don't, th this is freaking me out. Um, that being said, if you don't take the oath, you don't take the degree. Um, it, it's part of it. And, um, you know, like, like I said, I've and suggested my friends from, from for a long time take initiation. So it's not, I, I feel like talking about it probably makes it sound weirder than it is because we're like, oh, it's not a big deal, but I can't tell you. But like, um, it, it's part of, the, well, you know, seriously, <laughs> uh, you get the, the laugh cry face. But, um, but, the oaths are serious and they're important in like kind of thinking about them as you hear them is part of the experience. So I'm, I'm never going to tell you what the, what, what the oath is going to be. If you are taking your oath and um, you don't know about that next line, stop, think about it. You, you always can do that. If I can comment, uh, having been an initiator for decades, having seen hundreds of OTO initiations, I've only seen one OTO degree stop because a person needed greater clarification on their oath and the ritual stopped. They were taken out. Clarification was given on, on the particular point in the oath. And then they were invited to either step back in and receive the oath or depart. And they chose to go in and receive the rest of the oath. So I've never seen it ever, um, ever stop. I've never seen anyone walk away. Um, I have witnessed people take oaths very unconsciously, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird um, because you really should be paying very, very close attention to anything that you are taking an oath to. Um, and it's, it's really that matter of moving into ritual space where you drop into this very resonant space and you get really, really clear on what's going on. And it's a space of deep, deep listening. And um, there's nothing like taking an oath, especially to yourself and the universe, which is really what you're doing in this context, uh, that will allow you to come into conformance and alignment with your true will and purpose. Yeah. And um, like I said, if you if you pay attention, OTO will teach you how to be a thelemite and still have friends. If you don't pay attention, <laughs> then who knows? Um, I don't see any new questions. Does anyone have anything? Uh, I'm just oath averse having joined the military as a young lad, which I regretted. Um, I, I have, wish I could help you, but I cannot. <laughs> Uh, if there are no further questions, how much does it cost to take the Minerval degree? That um, is going to depend a little bit on the local body. At Horizon Lodge, it costs $105. And I think that 70 of that is your Grand Lodge dues for your first year. Um, the 30 and the Grand Lodge initiation fee, so 35 each. And then uh, I think Horizon charges another 100, uh, not 105, 35 for a total of 105. Because there's just, excuse me, costs associated with putting on the degree. So we're, we're not getting rich off this, I promise. I think the, yeah, uh, that's correct, Mary. Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about initiation in uh, 
eight weeks, I think. It's a, it'll be the fifth class in the series. Yep. And, and Lakea posted a link to uh, Seattle's membership and dues page there. So let's see if I'm right. Can you have organizational affiliations with other groups, non-spiritual, non-political? Uh, as a member, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you you can have other you can have affiliations with other spiritual groups or um, you know political groups. It, it, it's totally fine. Um, we have no say over your life outside of OTO. In yeah, general. <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. <laughs> yeah, that would be not an organization I'd want to be a part of. Yeah, Mary says uh, she is still a Wiccan high priestess. Yeah, we have we have um, you know I know of people who are uh, you know Masons or into Amoric or or what have you. So it's that's your business. <laughs> Can I be a member of another religion and join OTO? Yes, um, you can. Uh, sometimes people do that, and I think that it doesn't make sense, but. That's none of my business. Um, if you show up and are interested and, um, you know, follow the kind of code of conduct that I talked about and uh, people trust you enough to sponsor you, then yes, of course. As, as someone who sponsors people, I look for a, um, a genuine interest in studying what we have to offer, a genuine open-mindedness and, and you know, willingness to, uh, to, to study it. That's the main thing. Um, if that doesn't seem present for whatever reason, um, then I, I won't sponsor other people have different expectations, but for what it's worth, that's mine. Sorry. Can you repeat that? I said that I look for a, a, uh, a genuine interest in what OTO teaches and has to offer genuine engagement with the spirituality. And if that's not present, then for whatever reason, whether they are committed to another religion or, or whatever the reason is, then I'm not usually, I'm not going to be willing to sponsor. Other people have different criteria, but that's, that's something I look for. Mary says, I just started with Horizon and they definitely give you space to figure things out in your own time. Yeah, we're not going to come uh, knocking on your door Oh, Meryl, you're stealing the thunder from the fourth class. We have a follow-up class on that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so the, I, I'd explain it briefly, but I want people to come to, the, to that one. <laughs> uh, thank you all. I hope that uh, this has been useful. Um, you can probably see my contact, like, popping out of my eye. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> um, uh and we'll be putting this up on YouTube. If you have any questions or think of anything, uh, don't hesitate to contact us on Facebook or um, you uh, or via our website. Yeah, you can contact us through our webpage if you have any follow-up questions. Oh, um, no, Meryl, you weren't a pain in the butt. Uh, you're helpful. When and what is the next session? Uh, until Ikea, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I'm giving the next class two weeks from today. It is called, What is Thelema? where I will talk about the uh, religious philosophy animating all of this, what all this is about. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Not do it. Uh, nope. I already said that. Love is a law. Love under will. <laughs> Good night. Mm -hmm.